In this lesson, we will examine the classical and quantum mechanical description of a harmonic oscillator. This simple system is quite useful for describing vibrations of molecules. A harmonic oscillator is defined in classical mechanics as an object that obeys Hooke's law. Hooke's law is typically written as F equals negative K times X where F is the force that the particle feels at location X and K is a positive constant called the force constant. An example of a harmonic oscillator is an object attached to a wall with a spring. For the rest of this lesson, we will just use the term particle or oscillator to refer to this object. Hooke's law says that there is a location where the force on the particle is zero. We define that location as our origin, X equals zero and refer to the location as the equilibrium position. Hooke's law basically says that if the particle is not at the equilibrium position, it will experience a force that will push or pull it towards the equilibrium position. If the particle is located to the right of the origin at a positive x location, it will experience a force from the spring that pulls it to the left towards the equilibrium position. The leftward force is negative. If the particle is located left of the origin, a negative x location, it will experience a force from the spring that will push it to the right again towards the equilibrium position. The rightward force is possible. The farther the particle is from the equilibrium position, the stronger the force that is acting on it. Imagine that you are holding a harmonic oscillator at x equals a that is to the right of the equilibrium position as shown in the figure here. What happens when you let go? Let's take the time that you let go as time zero. This means at time zero, x is equal to a, and the velocity, which is the derivative of x with respect to time, is also zero. The particle will then move and speed up towards the left because it will be experiencing a pull towards the equilibrium position. It will keep speeding up until it reaches the equilibrium position where the force on it becomes zero. Even though there is no force at the equilibrium position, inertia keeps the particle moving past the equilibrium position. However, once it's on the left side of the equilibrium position, it will start slowing down since it will now experience a force pushing it back toward the equilibrium position. And eventually it will stop when it reaches x equals negative a. At that point, the rightward force will cause the particle to move to the right back towards the equilibrium position. It speeds up until it reaches the equilibrium position, then slows down again and eventually stops when it reaches x equals a. What we have just described is one cycle of motion. This cycle repeats over and over and over again. The trajectory of the particle can be summarized by this equation. This says the location x at time t is equal to a times cosine of omega t. Note that since the range of values for a cosine function is plus 1 to negative 1, the range of possible values for x is plus a to negative a. Every time the oscillator reaches x equals a or negative a, it turns around. In other words, it stops, then reverses direction. Thus, we refer to locations a and negative a as the classical turning points of the oscillator. Omega here is called the frequency of the oscillation in radians per unit time. The Greek letter nu is often used as a symbol for frequency in cycles per second. It is often convenient to write 2 pi times nu instead of omega. Remember that a cosine function completes a cycle when the argument changes by 2 pi. 2 pi radians per cycle times the number of cycles per second gives us the omega in radians per second. Omega can be shown to be equal to the square root of k over m, where m is the mass of the oscillator. How would you express the nu in terms of k and m? The frequency nu will just be equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k over m. 
Here's a quick overview of how we derive the classical trajectory of the harmonic oscillator. We start with Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of x with respect to time. For a harmonic oscillator, the force is negative k times x. So mass times the second derivative of x with respect to time is equal to negative k times x. We can rewrite this equation to second derivative of x with respect to t equals negative omega squared times x, where omega is the square root of k over m. We have seen this differential equation. It is exactly the same as the Schrodinger equation for the particle in a one-dimensional box, except that here, instead of psi, we have x, instead of x, we have t, and instead of k, we have omega. So, the general solution for this differential equation is x equals c1 times e to the i omega t plus c2 times e to the negative i omega t, where c1 and c2 are constants. If we take the derivative of x with respect to time, we get the general expression for the velocity. The velocity is equal to i omega times c1 times e to the i omega t plus negative i omega times c2 times e to the negative i omega t. As before, we determine the constants by applying boundary conditions. When t is 0, x is a. We plug in 0 for t and a for x here. Since e to the 0 is just equal to 1, the equation simplifies to a is equal to c1 plus c2. When t is 0, the velocity is 0. We plug in 0 here for t and 0 as well for the velocity. This is what we get. 0 equals i omega times c1 plus negative i omega times c2. This means that c1 is equal to c2. Since a is equal to c1 plus c2, it's easy to show that c1 and c2 are both equal to a over 2. Plugging in a over 2 for c1 and c2 into our general solution and using the Euler formula, we get our trajectory, x equals a times cosine of omega t. If we leave a harmonic oscillator alone, the law of conservation of energy says that its energy should be constant. We have seen that as the oscillator moves away from its turning point, it speeds up. That means its kinetic energy increases. Where did the energy come from? As it moves away from the equilibrium location, it slows down, eventually stopping at the turning point. The kinetic energy decreases. Where did the energy go? In other words, how do we account for kinetic energy changes when the total energy has to remain constant? The answer is that the energy of the oscillator is in two forms kinetic and potential. When the kinetic energy decreases, that means it is being converted into potential energy. Therefore, a drop in kinetic energy implies an increase in potential energy by the same amount. Similarly, an increase in kinetic energy implies a drop in potential energy by the same amount. For a harmonic oscillator, the potential energy can be shown to be equal to 1 half kx squared plus a constant. There is no absolute scale for potential energy, so as a matter of convenience, we can just take that constant as zero. Here's a plot of potential energy versus location. Now, suppose we have an oscillator whose turning points are x equals a and x equals negative a. What are the potential and kinetic energies at the turning point, x equals a? Substituting a for x in the expression for potential energy gives us a potential energy of 1 half times ka squared. At the turning point, the velocity is 0, and so is the kinetic energy. Therefore, the total energy at the turning point is just the potential energy, which is 1 half ka squared. But the total energy is constant, so this will be the total energy regardless of where the particle is. 
we know the particle will move to the left and gain speed. Let's see what happens when it's somewhere in between the right turning point and the equilibrium location. Let's pick this location. We can see that the potential energy has gone down by this much. So we can think of the length of this blue line as the kinetic energy. In general, we can say that the kinetic energy at point X is equal to the total energy minus the potential energy at point X. That's 1 half Ka squared minus 1 half Kx squared. At what location does the oscillator have the largest kinetic energy? It would be at the location where it has the lowest potential energy, here at the equilibrium position. The potential energy is zero and the kinetic energy is equal to the total energy, one half Ka squared. What happens to the kinetic energy when the oscillator is on its way from the equilibrium position to the left turning point? Let's say at this location. Well, from the equilibrium location to this location, the potential energy rises, and the kinetic energy is now smaller. What happens when the oscillator is at the left turning point? The total energy will now be all in the form of potential energy, and the kinetic energy is zero. The time independent Schrodinger equation, as always, is h hat psi equals e times psi. The Hamiltonian operator is equal to the kinetic energy operator, negative h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x, plus the potential energy operator, which in this case, for the harmonic oscillator, is 1 half times kx squared. When we solve the Schrodinger equation, we find that the quantum states are defined by a quantum number v, which is restricted to non-negative integers. This is the expression for the wave function. We will come back to examine this in detail. And here are the allowed energies, which we are now going to take a closer look at. Solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator gives the following result for the energy of the particle. The allowed energies are quantized and are equal to v plus 1 half times h bar omega or v plus 1 half times h nu. The quantum number of v must be a non-negative integer. Please don't confuse the quantum number, which is represented by lowercase v, with the frequency, which is represented by lowercase Greek letter nu. So, what is the ground state energy for a harmonic oscillator? That would be for v equals 0. 0 plus 1 half times h nu is equal to 1 half h nu. Here is an energy level diagram that shows the allowed energy levels superimposed on a plot of the potential energy function. Here's the ground state, the quantum state with lowest energy, which corresponds to quantum number v equal to 0. The ground state energy is 1 half h nu. Note that it is not zero. Here's the first excited state, 1.5 h nu or 3 halves h nu. What is the gap between the ground state and the first excited state? 1.5 h nu minus 0.5 h nu is equal to h nu. It's easy to see that in general, the gap between adjacent energy levels is equal to h nu. If the quantum number v differs by 1, the energy differs by h nu. So, what's the energy gap between quantum states v equals 1 and v equals 2? That would also be h nu. The wave functions, one for each allowed value of quantum number v, can be written as a product of three factors. The normalization constant, n sub v, is a factor that ensures that the integral of the square of the absolute value of the wave function over all space is 1. The polynomial factor is known as the Hermit polynomial. To make it less cumbersome to write, it's typically expressed in terms of a variable given here as y that is proportional to the value of x. Here, y is defined as x over alpha where alpha is the fourth root of h bar squared over mk. 
As we shall see, the polynomial factor gives rise to nodes in the wave functions. For quantum state V, the wave function has V nodes. Finally, the Gaussian factor is e to the negative y squared over 2. For convenience, it is also expressed as a function of y. This factor ensures that the wave function goes to zero as x approaches plus or minus infinity. This ensures that psi is normalizable. Let's familiarize ourselves with the form of the Hermit polynomials. Examine the polynomial shown here for v equals 0 to 5. How is the degree of the polynomial related to v? The degree of the polynomial is the highest power. We can see that for v equals 5, it's 5. For v equals 4, it's 4. For v equals 3, it's 3. For v equals 2, it's 2. For v equals 1, it's 1. And for v equals 0, it's 0. Note that the Hermit polynomial for v equals 0 is just a constant. Remember, y to the power 0 is equal to 1. In other words, the degree of the polynomial is just equal to v. Which of the polynomials only include even powers of y? These would be the polynomials for which v is even. For example, for v equals 4, we only see y to the power 4, y to the power 2, and y to the power 0. You can think of this constant here as being equal to itself multiplied by y to the power 0. In general, if v is even, the only powers of y we see are even numbers from 0 through v. Which of the polynomials include only odd powers of y? These would be the polynomials for which v is odd. For example, for v equals 3, we only see y to the power 3 and y to the power 1. In general, if v is odd, the only powers of y we see are odd numbers from 1 through v. Nodes in the wave function are due to nodes in the polynomial factor. Remember that a function changes sign across a node. So, to find the locations of the nodes for our Hermit polynomials, we just solve for the roots. This means find the locations where the function is equal to zero. How many roots does a Hermit polynomial have? The number of roots is just equal to the degree of the polynomial. In other words, the number of nodes will just be equal to v. Example, where are the nodes located for v equals 2? Here's the Hermit polynomial for v equals 2. It's negative 2 plus 4y squared. The degree of the polynomial is 2, so we expect two roots. To find the roots, we set the polynomial equal to 0, then solve for y. We find that for v equals 2, the Hermit polynomial is 0 at y equals square root of 1 half and negative square root of 1 half. Recall that the wave function is a product of a normalization constant, a Hermit polynomial, and a Gaussian function. Don't forget that the variable y here is a scaled version of x, so the polynomial and Gaussian factors are functions of x. Let's examine what the Gaussian function looks like. For v equals 0, we saw that the Hermit polynomial is just equal to 1. So, the wave function for v equals 0 is just a Gaussian function times the normalization constant. Here's a plot of the wave function for v equals 0 versus x. We can see that the plot is bell-shaped, and as we move away from the equilibrium location, the function rapidly approaches 0. Remember that the equilibrium location for the harmonic oscillator is at x equals 0. We can see that the Gaussian factor will not cause the overall function to change algebraic sign, so it won't be responsible for any nodes in the wave function. As mentioned earlier, nodes in the wave function are due to the polynomial factor. What the Gaussian factor does is ensure that our wave function is well behaved. The Hermit polynomials are not well behaved because they do not go to zero as we go very far away from the equilibrium position, so they are not quadratically integrable. In fact, 
except for v equals zero, the Hermit polynomials go to positive or negative infinity as we move very far away from the equilibrium position. However, multiplying them by the Gaussian factor yields a function that does go to zero. Let's take a look at plots of the wave function. You will notice the following patterns. First, the nodes are symmetric around x equals zero. For quantum state v, the number of nodes is equal to v. When v is odd, then the origin or equilibrium position is a node. The wave function is also an odd function. If you replace x by negative x, the magnitude of psi remains the same, but the algebraic sign changes. When v is even, then the origin is not a node. The wave function is an even function. If you replace x by negative x, the value of the function is the same. Let's take a look at this function. We've seen this earlier. Here's the vertical axis and here's the x-axis. We can see that there is no node, so quantum number v is equal to zero. The plot is symmetric with respect to the vertical axis, so the function is even. Note that far away from the origin, the function approaches zero. How about this one? What do you think is the quantum number for the wave function? Here's the vertical axis. Here's the x-axis. We can see that there are two nodes, this one and this one. So v is equal to 2. There is no node at the origin. The plot is symmetric with respect to the vertical axis, so the function is even. Again, we can see that far away from the origin, the function approaches zero. How about this one? Here's the vertical axis. Here's the x-axis. We can see that there is one node, so v is equal to 1. The node is at the origin. The function is odd because the plot is not symmetric with respect to the vertical axis. But it is anti-symmetric with respect to the origin. This means if we draw a line from a point to the origin, extending that line by the same length to the other side gets to a point that corresponds to where both x and psi have opposite algebraic signs. How about this one? Here's the vertical axis. Here's the x-axis. We can see that there are nodes, one at the origin and two more that are equidistant from the origin. So v is equal to 3. The function is odd. We can see that the plot is anti-symmetric with respect to the origin. Shown here is a chart showing plots of the five lowest energy wave functions for the harmonic oscillator. This chart is packed with information. The plots of the wave function are superimposed on the energy level diagram and the potential energy function. Note that, obviously, the vertical scales for the wave functions are different from the energy scale. Consider the wave function that is drawn here with one node. What is the quantum number associated with this wave function? The number of nodes is equal to quantum number v, so this is the wave function for quantum state v equals 1. So this dashed horizontal line corresponds to where the wave function is 0. But this dashed line also corresponds to the energy for v equals 1, which is 1.5 h nu. The classical turning points for each energy level are also indicated by dashed vertical lines. For v equals 1, this corresponds to the left turning point and this corresponds to the right turning point. The classical turning points can be calculated by equating the expression for classical energy, which is 1 half Ka squared, to the allowed quantum energy, which is V plus 1 half H nu. Then solving for A. For quantum number V, the classical turning point is the square root of 2 times V plus 1 half H nu divided by K. The animation shown here is the classical prediction of how the particle with energy of 1.5 H nu would behave. It would be confined between the classical turning points for V equals 1. Locations outside this region are said to be classically forbidden if the particle only has this much energy. However, if you examine the wave function for V equals 1 carefully, 
you will note that the wave function has a finite non-zero value outside the classical turning points. This means that there is a finite probability of finding the particle beyond the classical turning points. This quantum prediction of being able to find the particle in the classically forbidden region is called tunneling. The probability density function for locating the particle is the square of the absolute value of psi. For quantum state v equals zero, the probability density function is shown here. Let's see how the quantum prediction differs from the classical prediction. According to quantum mechanics, where is the most probable location of the particle? That would be where the probability density function is at a maximum. For this quantum state, v equals zero, that would be at the equilibrium position, x equals zero. Here are the classical turning points. Classical mechanics predicts that the oscillator slows down as it approaches the classical turning points. Therefore, classical mechanics predicts that the most probable location would be near the turning points. Beyond the classical turning points, you can see that the probability density function is small, but not zero. This means that there is a small but finite probability of finding the particle beyond the classical turning points. For v equals zero, this turns out to be about 8%. Here's the probability density function for v equals 12. We can see that it resembles the classical expectation a little bit better than v equals zero. The maximum probability density is now closer to the turning points. The probability of finding the particle in the classically forbidden region beyond the turning points is also smaller. According to the Bohr correspondence principle, quantum mechanics should essentially make the same prediction as classical mechanics in cases where classical mechanics is known to be valid. We therefore expect that such systems will have a very large quantum number V. Here's another way of seeing how, in accord with the Bohr correspondence principle, quantum mechanics essentially agrees with classical mechanics when the quantum number V is very large. Our experience with the macroscopic world suggests that the turning point for a harmonic oscillator is continuous. We should be able to stretch a particle attached to a spring by any small amount we want. But the energy quantization predicted by quantum mechanics means the turning point is also quantized. Here's the right turning point of the oscillator if it is in quantum state V equals zero. And here it is if the oscillator is in quantum state V equals one. It's farther away from the equilibrium position. Locations between these two are not allowed as turning points. Here's the right turning point for quantum state V equals two. Notice that the difference in the turning points for V equals one and two is not as big as the difference between V equals zero and one. This is understandable since the potential energy curve becomes steeper at higher V levels. Therefore, we expect at very high V levels, the difference in turning points between consecutive allowed energy levels would be much, much smaller. In other words, we expect to observe essentially classical behavior at very high V levels. Let's take a look at the expectation value of location or average location of a harmonic oscillator. Based on symmetry, we expect the average location to be at the equilibrium position at x equals zero. If we want to work it out, we evaluate the integral of psi star x psi from x equals negative infinity to positive infinity. Whenever we do an integration over symmetric limits, it is very helpful to examine if the integrand is an odd function. If that is the case, we know right away that the integral is equal to zero. Here we are integrating between symmetric limits. The lower limit is negative infinity and the upper limit is positive infinity. So let's examine the integrand, psi star times x times psi. Psi is either an odd function or an even function. It's odd if V is odd, it's even if V is even. But psi star times psi will always be an even function. That's because an odd function multiplied by an odd function is even. 
and an even function multiplied by an even function is also even. How about x? Well, x raised to any odd power is an odd function. x is just x to the power 1, so it is an odd function. So our integrand, psi star x psi, which we can also write as x times psi star psi, must be an odd function. When an odd function is multiplied by an even function, the result is an odd function. x is an odd function, psi star psi is an even function. Our integrand is odd, our integral is equal to zero.